All right. Okay, thank you to the organizers for uh, inviting me. And um, I'll be talking about the work that we uh, initiated after the um, 2017 wildfires. So uh, two months prior to those fires, this is just a, a, one of those you know, daily uh, snapshots of uh, Northwest uh, United States. And you can see that there were actually quite a few fires going on at that point in time. Um, and at that, the, the large fires here were the ones that were about 30,000 acres. Uh, and uh, most of them were started by lightning. These are you know, forest fires. So um, then on October 8th, two months later, uh, was this outbreak of multiple fires that grew to be very, very large, as you, you all are aware. And um, in the interest of time, I'm really not going to dwell on this, but you know, the combination of deaths and destruction of homes um, and many, many people evacuated and lives disrupted uh, really um, was, was horrific for many people and waking up in the middle of the night. So you know, the title of the film, Waking Up to Wildfires, um, it's kind of got two, there's two messages there, um, both the literal and, and uh, waking up to, you know, we have to take this seriously. Um, <clears throat> so this was Coffee Park on October 8th and um, a kind of a typical suburban type of neighborhood in California. It sort of reminded me of one that I'd grown up in, um, which may be why I was so hypnotized by uh, what was going on that week. And then um, this was October 9th, so um, the contrast, of course, is really clear. And uh, kind of the set of the little park back in the background, you can see. Um, that weekend, um, I began preparing for submission for this uh, wonderful mechanism that the National Institutes of Health, specifically NIEHS, Institute for Environmental Health Sciences, has called uh, Mechanism for Time Sensitive Research. And um, these are, it's a, it, they're, I think they learned after the um, Deepwater Horizon that they weren't able to mobilize people quickly enough to really do some of the, the sampling that they would have liked to have had. And so they instituted this much faster than typical NIH mechanism, which normally takes about nine months between when you apply if you're really lucky and you get funded the first time. Um, so uh, uh, we began preparing a, an application. And, um, and the map over there is, um, uh, so I'm in Davis, which is slightly off that map, but there's the Napa fire, and every weekend um, I take Amtrak and I go down to Berkeley, uh, and that was uh, about 40 miles away from the Napa fires. And on Friday night, my, my daughter called me and said, I think, Mom, you might not want to come this weekend. And um, when I got to the stop just before uh, uh, Berkeley, um, I looked out and I actually could hardly see these homes that I knew were about 30 feet away from the the train, so um, I realized she was right. Um, so there are multiple issues that seemed to need to be addressed um, by research. And uh, as I started just looking through the literature, uh, I discovered that, in fact, there was, uh, th there was a bit that had been published about respiratory effects and kind of in the short term. But there was a real paucity of, in fact, I could not find any studies with really long-term follow-up of, of wildfire survivors um, uh, that, that were more than a year out from, from the fire. So I thought, well, that's really a, a gap that, that needs to be addressed. Um, so these were the eight counties that all had um, large enough fires that many people were evacuated. And, uh, um, and then there's another eight there that were the counties that, because the winds were southerly, um, uh, or do you call that northerly when it's coming from the north? I don't know what you call it. Anyway, heading southward, um, we, we mapped out some of these other counties that were targeted as well, um, in, including the Bay Area counties and um, Sacramento County, Yolo County, which is where Davis itself is, and Placer County, and then Alameda and Contra Costa and Marin and San Mateo and so forth. So um, we, we mapped out a, a number of different projects. And in our center, we have people with a lot of varied kinds of, uh, of expertise. We have some air pollution experts. We have um, uh, director of the Air Quality Research Center, Tony Wexler. We have uh, 
a couple of chemists who were really interested in analyzing ash samples, and I'll come to some of those towards the end. Uh, but I'm going to focus primarily on the health, uh, the online survey, which is where uh, we have currently quite a bit of data. Whoops, did I go the wrong direction? Yes, I did. Okay. Um, so this, these were our overall goals. Um, one is we wanted to be able to describe the population in, um, in, in regard to their experiences and the kinds of needs that they had. Uh, from very early on, I contacted people at several of the county health departments, um, also some people at, from a variety of agencies around from both state and county uh, to you know, figure out how we might design this to be helpful to agencies that um, are making policies and responding to, uh, to you know, provide, trying to provide services. So that led to adding a, a number of questions about people's needs at different points along the way, both kind of in the immediate aftermath and then a little bit later. Um, we wanted to learn about smoke and contamination. We wanted to address both the physical and the mental health uh, consequences. And uh, I, it seemed as if there were very few studies that had done both um, at that point. And then also, um, as I said, interested in long term, so we wanted to establish cohorts that we could then follow up over time. Uh, one of the hypotheses that we wanted to pursue was to what extent does the underlying socioeconomic status of a community uh, impact the long-term impact, uh, affect the long-term impacts um, in terms of health and recovery. And in fact, um, these wildfires, you know, someone said they were kind of equal opportunity. There were some very poor neighborhoods and also very wealthy neighborhoods that were hit very hard. And so, um, you know, the sort of natural experiment concept uh, arose that uh, we could take communities that had equal um, exposures in terms of losses of homes and, and uh, you know, the fire and escapes and that sort of thing and compare over time uh, what their recovery might be like and how it might differ. And, uh, and then uh, collaboration and communication with, with local organizations, um, and again, to make sure that what we were doing would be helpful as agencies and nonprofits and service organizations are trying to figure out how to be prepared for future similar disasters. Um, and one of the things we did was hire this communication specialist, which is Jennifer Biddle. She's in the back. She's the person who got us in touch with Paige Birma, the documentary filmmaker. And um, we embarked on, on supporting, uh, developing that, that film. Um, she also does a lot of social media, which has helped us to, to reach out as well. The um, online survey covers uh, all of the things listed on this slide, basic information from the households, um, who the members of the household are, because we have one respondent who gives information about all of the members of the household. Um, what happened when the fires broke out for them, Evacuation details, um, the recovery period, that's where we asked about their needs and their concerns. Um, we asked about handling debris, did they sift through debris trying to, you know, uh, recover personal effects and so forth. Um, and, then, uh, and then we got to employment status, uh, whether that had been affected, um, other kinds of losses, losses of pets, losses of, you know, besides homes, their you know, loved ones, people who, uh, who, who did die. Um, loss of job, loss of childcare, and that sort of thing. And then um, their, their prior health status, and then uh, the health symptoms that they experienced um, immediately after the fires or during, uh, demographics, and then contact information for future studies. So um, this is a caution. <laughs> this is uh, to interpret things very, um, take, take everything with a little bit of a grain of salt, what I'm going to report, because nothing I'm going to report has uh, undergone peer review at this point in time. And I'm actually not going to give you a whole lot of detail because I, you know, I don't want to have it posted and then I can't publish it. So, um, but, but I will give you some, some, uh, some of the information, some descriptive information here. Um, so I'm not wasting too much time. Um, the survey sample is not a representative one. This was a convenience sample. We publicized it through the you know, media, social media as well as regular media. 
uh, we wanted to do a door-to-door -door survey, and we, uh, but it took us so long to be able to hire someone uh, to do that that we didn't go into the field until more than a year later. And at that point in time, we were having a, actually a very difficult time with the door-to-door -door method. So in Butte County, we've been taking a, a kind of broader view of, of how to do that. Uh, and we have not adjusted for the fact that we have uh, uh, multiple people in the same household um, being for whom we have data. So just a description of the population. We had uh, over 2,000 households that responded, representing over 6,000 household members. Um, most of them were actually from Sonoma County, and that probably had more to do with where a lot of we focused some of the publicity in the beginning and, um, and took a while to, to expand outside, but we did get uh, people from uh, all 16 of those counties and a few others. Um, and then you can see the mean age of the adults was about uh, 49 years. The respondents were slightly older. Um, they were the subset that actually completed the, the survey itself. Um, and then we had children as well. Um, there were people who owned their homes, 27% uh, rented, and about almost 40% had been 12 years or more in the same home, but then there was another 21% that had been less than two years. So um, it was a very highly educated group. Um, and because I have a lot here. Uh, so how did you first learn about the wildfires? This was interesting. Um, these are not all the possible answers, but one in four, it was from a family member, um, not in the household. And people can answer more than one of these. Um, uh, from a neighbor, one in five, saw flames, one in seven. A lot of people saw the flames. <laughs> that was the first thing they knew, and they looked out their window and uh, ran. Um, smelled smoke, one in three. Um, or they heard about it on the news, um, one in eight. Um, from the respondents, in, so not a representative sample of, of, of the population because it's, you know, um, it's about 60% actually uh, had to, uh, to evacuate. And um, uh, a good third of those had to relocate to multiple locations. Sometimes they went somewhere and they evacuated, but that place was too close to the fires uh, or another one of the fires. Um, at the time they filled out the survey, three quarters of them had returned uh, home, and 15% uh, though their home was completely destroyed. And um, uh, a large majority said that they were likely or very, very likely to remain in the same county. Um, where they had lived before the fires broke out. Um, of course, the majority, their home was still standing. Um, and then there was, this was questions about needs. Um, did you have to spend two days or more? And we also had a week or more um, without various things. Uh, these are just a few of them. Electricity, um, almost 40% um, were without electricity for uh, a few days. And cell service. Um, safe drinking water, 15%. Um, and adequate clothing, 20%. Um, greatest need one week after the wildfires. Um, and we had over 600 people who filled out kind of the open-ended responses here. And they, they really fell into, almost all of them fell into these, uh, what, six or eight um, major themes here. Um, the housing was a big issue. Um, the air quality, sleep or solace, um, uh, some peace of mind, psychotherapy. Uh, and then sort of more physical things, and then medi medications, which was mentioned earlier today, people having to, you know, escape for their lives, and they didn't um, have their medications with them. Um, concerns that they wanted to, would have liked uh, uh, officials to address uh, had to do with air quality, water quality, soil, um, food contamination, and and how, you know, what they should do to protect themselves from the, from the smoke and fire. Um, and so respiratory symptoms, um, you know, as we know, smoke uh, does affect the lungs. Uh, so no surprises here. More than 5% had an asthma attack or bronchitis. This is in the, the basically the three weeks um, following when the fires broke out. Um, more than 50% had an asthma attack among those with prior asthma. And um, more than 10% of people of the total population had wheezing or whistling in the chest, and uh, over a quarter had um, cough. Um, so those with pre-existing asthma um, were actually uh, 
fourfold more likely uh, to report either having uh, an asthma attack, bronchitis, or wheezing and whistling in the chest uh, compared to those without pre-existing asthma. So that is one of the vulnerable populations to be aware of. Um, and um, we did look at age differences. Um, and for the most part, actually, the children seemed quite similar to the adults. But again, this is not a good, nice, beautiful, multivariate analysis adjusted for all sorts of things, um, but just kind of very preliminarily. Um, uh, and the one thing that was different was they were more likely to actually experience fever or have sneezing or a cold. Um, and um, I'm going to sort of just move through these. These are some of the open-ended questions that uh, people responded to. So anecdotal, but, but interesting information. The, these, these surveys were filled out between the end of January and very late in, in uh, 2018. So between four and you know, 12 or so months after the fires, and, and many people were still reporting um, respiratory symptoms. One of our goals then is to find out really how long do those symptoms persist with our follow-up survey, which we've also gone live with. Um, so this is four months later. So that was actually, sorry, the previous one I think was, um, uh, uh, oh yeah, this is, yeah, all of these are four, a month, four or more months later. So at the time that they, were, that they were filling it out, this is what people were saying. Um, and then questions that they posed, which I thought well, these are really these are really the, getting right at the heart of what people need to know. Um, you know, what are the long-term health effects of breathing smoke every year, three years running? Um, you know, our idea of an acute event is now where it's episodic. It's you know, what's the the blur? The line between acute and chronic is is getting blurred here. Um, and then concern about a child who was exposed at at age two. Um, what are the long-term effects there and, you know, the potential um, ramifications of Lisa Miller's work on, on the monkeys um, may bear on that. And then what about the ash? What about um, uh, pollutants still in the soil and in the air? How deep do we need to clean the homes? Um, can we keep the carpets? Uh, how long can it take to see illness that might be caused by the burning of the chemicals um, in, in homes and households? Um, we also did look at a couple of health equity questions here. So this is um, respiratory conditions where we looked at the neighborhood SES based on census uh, variables. And uh, we found that um, in those in the lower SES neighborhoods, there was a, 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 an association of increased incidence uh, for respiratory conditions um, compared to neighborhoods um, of higher SES. So uh, there do, does seem to be an interaction here um, with, uh, with SES. Um, and this actually is an adjusted analysis um, where we adjust it for age, sex, education, county, and sex of respondent. By the way, if the respondent was a male, um, there was substantially fewer symptoms being reported. So the reporter, the sex of the report, the person reporting seemed to be a really important factor we need to adjust for. Um, and then uh, this is about uh, the age effect and uh, um, respiratory conditions in general increased with age. Um, uh, although asthma had, had more of a U-shape, uh, the younger ages and the older ages. Um, but that, that, that actually broke down into um, two different, a sex interaction with age. So as in the general population incidence of asthma, the uh, respiratory conditions impacted by wildfire smoke uh, shows a greater increase at younger ages in boys and a greater increase at older ages in the females. So um, I will, I'm going to skip over mental health then because I think I'm out of time. And um, I might have time because I'm on the next panel too. Um, uh, this is just showing these are, and I guess we've seen a few slides like this of the multiple uh, large fires since the big 2017 fires, um, these are fires that either had fatalities or larger um, acreage, very large acreage and uh, destruction of, of homes. Um, so this is some of the things that we have planned. There, we do have a pregnancy cohort also uh, that was formed uh, that Dr. Schmidt has been working with um, and, um, and doing follow-up studies and so forth. Um, these, of course, there's exposures happen in a lot of different aspects of the, the experience. Uh, 
the acute exposures, the people salvaging through debris. Um, we've heard a lot about exposures today, so I won't dwell on that. And I'm going to talk about this part in the next session, too. So um, I will skip through that. And thank you very much. Um, and these are some of our collaborators. And thank you.